When it launched in November of 2001, Halo Combat Evolved took the gaming industry by storm. It was praised for its storytelling, characters, and thrilling gameplay, and went on to inspire an entire generation of games that tried to copy its winning formula. At the center of that first game was its protagonist, Master Chief, a badass hero that took charge and did whatever was necessary to save humanity from the alien threat of the Covenant. Outside of some dialogue and a few one-liners delivered by the appropriately gruff and rugged voice of Stephen Downs, Chief is a mostly silent protagonist. He prefers to let his guns do the talking, so to speak, so there is little character development for him in this first game, which actually makes him a great self-insert playable character. With the massive success of the games came the inevitable rumblings of a film adaptation. Anybody who enjoys video games knows that Hollywood butchers adaptations for breakfast, so we were a little bit worried. Thankfully, the Halo film was in development hell for many years until it was eventually cancelled. Then in 2013, Steven Spielberg himself made an announcement that his company Amblin Television would be producing a Halo TV series in conjunction with Xbox Entertainment. It's Steven Spielberg, so surely this will be the live action Halo that fans have been clamouring for, right? Wrong. After almost a decade of troubled development, we now have the live-action Halo TV series, and it's pretty awful. The show's story, created by showrunners Kyle Killen and Stephen Kane, was set to take place in the Silver Timeline. This alternate timeline would not be tied down to the deep Halo lore and canon. This seems like a strange direction to go in, until you learn the most infuriating fact about Stephen Kane. He has never touched a Halo game. In fact, in an interview with Variety, he plain out said, We didn't look at the game. We didn't talk about the game. We talked about the characters in the world, so I never felt limited by it being a game. What the fuck is he talking about? That's like a financial advisor or press secretary not understanding what inflation is. Picture Denis Villeneuve saying, We didn't look at the Dune book. We didn't talk about the book. We talked about the characters in the world, so I never felt limited by it being a book. It's unfathomable. By not experiencing the source material in its native medium, you completely missed the point of what made the property connect with people initially. And so much of what Kane missed is apparent by anybody with a passing knowledge of Halo lore, especially these guys. The Silver Timeline is used as an excuse to wholly change many characters, add new ones that are just awful, and change the series protagonist so much that he's one, dreadfully boring, and two, basically unrecognizable from his video game incarnation. The opening minutes of the series premiere were promising. A violent battle took place between the Madrigal Insurgents and the Covenant, before the Spartan Silver Team, which I suppose the timeline is named after, drops in and cleans up the alien threat. There is some shoddy CGI work, but the fight choreography and action are mostly satisfying and reminiscent of the games, even featuring a few first-person shots through a Spartan visor. From that point on, there is no real big action scene until Episode 5, Reckoning. The series instead chooses to use that time to cover Dr. Halsey's unethical experiments that led to the creation of the Spartan program. This was one of the things that the show got mostly right coming from the games. Halsey's relationship with her Spartans is surprisingly faithful, going so far as to have them go against UNSC orders and instead follow her own directions. The show stars Pablo Schreiber as Spartan John 117, aka Master Chief, or at least that's the character he's supposed to be. In a huge divergence from the games, the show takes most of its nine episodes exploring his human side, though not in a way that is particularly interesting or engaging. After touching a Forerunner artifact, John begins to have his repressed memories unlocked. This happens within the first episode, and from that point, we only get short glimpses of the Master Chief we know and love. With the show immediately diving into Chief's poorly written emotional struggle, it's difficult to understand why anybody would care. You only saw him as a soldier for a few minutes in the beginning, and immediately after that, he's a broken, emotional compromised person. This feels unearned. If you don't have any connection to Chief as a character, why would his emotional turmoil be resonant to you in any way? It's just lazy, wasteful writing. Master Cheeks also spends much of the show in varying levels of undress. Seriously. First, he ditched his helmet, which no longer made him an avatar for the viewer. Now, seeing John without his helmet was jarring, but not entirely unusual, as there have been glimpses of the soldier's face over the years. But in episode 2, they step it up. He removes his green armor and wears only his undersuit. Then, in episode 3, he earns his nickname, Master Cheeks, appearing completely butt naked. Just full on Spartan ass on screen, like Christopher Lambert in the 90s. Over the course of essentially 9 hours, Master Cheeks only does a handful of useful things, and the show uses imagery from the Halo Infinite reveal trailer, where Chief has his helmet resting on his hip, no less than 3 times. Every time it happens, it feels like a desperate attempt at fan service that is just unearned. 
As if that wasn't bad enough, the audience has to contend with Quan Ha, the daughter of the Madrigal insurrectionist leader. After Master Chick saves her from execution, we're forced to endure constant tantrums, inability to make good decisions, and general annoyingness whenever she's on screen. The character is so bad that when she separates from her bodyguard, Spartan 066, who is the highlight of the series and says, we'll see each other again, the Spartan breaks the fourth wall and replies, God, I hope not. By the end of season one, Quan is positioned by witches as the key to a portal. So unfortunately, it seems that she'll be returning in the already greenlit season two. Her magical reintegration to the show's story is just one of the few things that make absolutely no sense. For instance, there's a focus in one of the episodes on Miranda Keeves, trying to decipher the Covenant's language. It results in a nice interaction between her and Kai, one of the members of Silver Team. But if Miranda works for the UNSC, and they have access to the Spartan's helmet recordings, why does the translation process take so long? It ends up being a way to reveal the word Halo in the Covenant language, which is another issue. When Cheeks meets Soren on the rubble, an outlaw community that has taken up shelter inside of an asteroid, he's introduced to a character that somehow has been imbued with all of the Covenant's plans. Then at that point, in just episode 2 of the show, this character, who only appears once, tells John that the Halo rings are galaxy-destroying weapons. This revelation is completely deflating, especially so damn early in the show. In the first Halo game, the fact that the Halo rings were weapons was a huge reveal towards the end of the game. They had so much magic and mystery surrounding them for almost the entirety of the campaign. And now in the show, we know what they are before anybody steps foot on one, and before we even get a glimpse of what they look like. Outside of the early revelation, perhaps one of the worst additions to the Halo TV show is McKee, a character who's introduced as the clap to Master's cheeks. She was abducted and raised by the Covenant from a young age and indoctrinated, much like him. However, she's used to further assassinate his character. She connives her way into the UNSC base, where Cheeks and the artifact are located, in order to steal the second artifact and set up the grand finale of the show. But before she makes her escape, they have sex as Cortana looks on. This baffling turn of events seems to have been the only reason this character was introduced into the show. Things continue their downward spiral all the way up to the end of the show. After McKee triggers both artifacts, John becomes incapacitated due to his shared connection with them. The only way to help the rest of Silver Team, according to the screenwriter, is to have Cortana take over his mind. This effectively kills Cheeks for the moment, but it results in something strange. He becomes a silent, lethal, covenant killing machine, and his helmet stays on. We finally get to see something that resembles the Master Chief from the games, yet in a way that is completely nonsensical and offensive to the original character. Master Chief was never a husk being controlled by Cortana. His stoic nature was a character trait, not the result of him being a vegetable trapped in his own body. I just had to wonder who the show was made for. The sci-fi trappings are barely there for most of the show outside of the rubble. The quality of the special effects is woefully inconsistent, with really poor effects showing up in the same scene as the completely rendered Covenant races. There seems to be little to entice a fresh audience, and even less for those who have grown up loving the series. They spend so much time setting up events that never happen, and by the end, everything is basically back to square one, with humanity in possession of the Forerunner artifact. They're hiding behind the silver timeline to excuse the changes they've made, but they've changed so much that the show we have doesn't deserve to be named Halo. It's not fan service, it's franchise servicing. <laughs>